Hello and welcome back to Dragon Talk, the coffee talk uh, uh, edition of <laughs> uh, Dragon Talk. We are live from Gary Con in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. 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 That's the accent that everyone uh, knows and loves from Wisconsin. That's how Pacific Northwest. You've got say cheese it. in your mouth or something. <laughs> exactly that right. Out of that word. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're, I'm Greg Tito, and I'm joined by Shelley Sh Mazzanoble. Uh, is that your name? Yeah. Nice. I'm new here. It hasn't changed. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't changed. Nope. Uh, Not but since we have half our hour guest. Though. Here, Mike Carr. Welcome. Hello. 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 Uh, so many of the uh, adherents to the history of Dungeons and Dragons may not know uh, your name as much as uh, they should. Uh, yes. And you have just in when we were just chatting before we started here, you have many, many firsts A next to your thirst. name. Uh, and uh, one of them might be uh, uh, r playing the first cleric ever. Uh, in Dungeons and Dragons. Is that true? That's certainly true. And as uh, a lot of the people who are deeply into this know, uh, John Peterson is uh, one of the top historians of this whole hobby and yeah. TSR and so on. And uh, he introduced me to his wife as this is Mike Carr. He's the very first cleric character ever in Dungeons and Dragons. And I started laughing. I said, I said, John, that's absolutely true, but I've never been introduced as such before. <laughs> so. Well, I'll take that uh, uh, distinction again here on the air. And uh, occasionally at Gary Con here, you know, I'll stick my head in the room, and uh, one of the dungeon masters from the TSR days would say, "Oh, here's here's Mike Carr. He's the first cleric character ever in Dungeons and Dragons." And these assorted players go, "Ooh!" ooh. So, uh, so uh, who knew back in the day that that was going to actually uh, amount to anything? Yeah. So how yeah. did that, how did that come about? Were you playing in Dave Arneson's uh, yes. campaign? Yes. Yes. I grew up in St. Paul, and as most people know, that's where Dave Arneson was. And mm -hmm. uh, I met him. That's a whole other story. How we met and developed a uh, uh, friendship and so on. But uh, we played uh, when he created the, the Blackmore. Um, world and campaign, modest as it was to start. Um, they were doing uh, initial adventures and so on, and uh, um, he asked me, would you like to be a cleric? And I guess I will, sure, okay. Um, and there were, you know, very few guidelines at that, that time. Uh, no edged weapons, though, right off of the, right from the get-go, and mm -hmm. so I had a mace, um, and he s explained that uh, you've got some uh, uh, special powers, not truly magic, but your power is going to be coming from your deity, Mm. Um, and so you, you supplement what uh, wizards are doing. Um, so it was, you know, not a bad uh, uh, initial concept and so on, uh, you know, already in his mind and explained that. So uh, he said, you've got a modest church in, uh, in town here, and they're going to be asking you to come on adventures. And so we, I participated in some of the original ad adventures. I sure wish I had any of the notes back from back <laughs> in the day yeah. or, you know, what the name of the guy was or anything like that. But who knew? You know, it's just like any other gaming session. Uh, who knew that it had uh, such ramifications in the long run? So it was, it was gratifying. It was kind of fun. I remember early on we fought a Balrog, which really, uh, you know, what does, what's a Balrog? I, you know, and uh, I didn't Before know. Before IP so considerations were Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I f learned pretty soon that uh, Balrog's a pretty hefty uh, opponent <laughs> and a monster. And, you know, we, had to, we were lucky to get out of there. And, you know, I think we probably lost one or two members of our party. So... It was a, you know, it was a very true to D and D. Quite a, you know, it was quite a, you know, for beginning level characters, it was rather a, a, a daunting challenge uh, to face such Especially a monster. Especially for a, a first time cleric. Yes, yes. You know how to heal no. these people? Right. Yeah. No. Was it used? Was the word cleric used? Was that? Yes. Yeah. yeah that yeah, was that yeah, was how yeah. it was framed in, in his mind. Yeah, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah. That's really neat. So kind of a cool thing. And uh, were you able to heal at all? Yeah, but you know, pretty limited. But yes, yeah, that's obviously why you want to bring a cleric along for of those other. Reasons. And that was, that was his pitch to you, like you're going to be the the, the quote unquote healer. Yeah, and we had I think we had an elf and a dwarf. I mean, it was you know, uh, it was for for being the first and or initial sort of thing. It you know it was still fairly f well formed in terms of concept of different character class. Yeah. I don't didn't call them classes at, at the time, but the now yeah, get go. But um, yeah, it was you know had different a mix of things. Uh, interestingly. A lot of people, and, and Dave, of course, and, and, and so many people are interested in the fantasy world, um, are, are deep into the Lord of the Rings and the Tolkien books and, you know, that whole world. But yeah. I was not. I'm always, uh, I'm a history guy, and mm -hmm. my, my degree's in history, and I always loved history, military history, and history in general, and so on. So I'm not steeped in the legends of Tolkien and all that, and, you know, when people start talking about that, you know, I can't participate in the discussion because I, I'm just not as interested. Same with science fiction. I just... I just, uh, you know, I'm a history realism sort of mm. uh, interested uh, person and not so much um, fantasy and science fiction. So how did you bring that to bear uh, for, for the cleric? Because there's not necessarily a, a historical uh, 
analog to that. I guess you could say yeah. a knight or, 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 or someone of Charlemagne or something like that could be a yeah, cleric, have I a, guess. Yeah, a historical but reference. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. How, how, did, how did you combine that, that love of history and, and bring well, it to the Well, it was pretty interesting. I mean, yeah. obviously, uh, that, you know, since this was kind of an offshoot of chain mail, mm. it, you know, I knew it had a medieval um, basis. Yeah, and went from that sort of thing, and then you know, of course, part of the medieval history was the Crusades and that sort of thing. Where, yeah, you know, in those days, the clerics couldn't heal <laughs> in real history, but nonetheless, you know, that's uh, there was a big religious uh, aspect to a whole medieval life, not not oh you know, right, now that makes crusading sense. Crusading and all that sort of thing. Yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of how it starts. So I happened to be in St. Paul, and that's where Dave Artisan was, and he's several years, I think it's f- four years older than I was. Mm-hmm. So now this time I'm. 16, 17 years old. Oh, so wow. This is when you were playing the cleric? Yeah, right wow. when I started, yeah. So, um, Youngin'. Back Many of the people in this room are that age right now. <laughs> 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 well, good for them. They got, they got uh, a long history they of, they got of, a lot of, of, lot of good times ahead of them, I yeah, hope. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So. What year was this? What, uh, uh, when, when this was this was, happening? This was, well, I hesitate to say a year because anybody who knows the history would correct me. Right. You can give a well, range. Late, well, late late 60s. Late 60s, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, um, and then you... Was, that's when we started doing different things, and then uh, the, the Black Morning, I think it was early 70s, um, was when they were getting... Because, you know, Dun- Dungeons and Dragons was published in 74, mm-hmm. right. I think. So, but there was... So this was the genesis, of the, which was the prior. So I'm going to say early 70s. But um, we didn't know it at the time, but it turned out, uh, and Dave Wesley would be a guy to tell you about this, um, it turned out that in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities, greater area and suburbs, we had at that time, this being the late 60s, probably the biggest concentration of gamers in the world. Mm. Now, we always thought that that was in England because gaming and wargaming was, you know, Don Featherstone was there and they were having miniature stuff. Till uh, the story, this is maybe apocryphal, but um, Ross Maker, one of the Twin Cities guys, went to England and he looked up Don Featherstone and he thought, I'm going to have this, you know, having a gaming get together and he saw. It was a relatively small number of people, and then only then did we realize that, you know, we have something really going special in the Twin Cities. And the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, I happened to be there right at the time when all of this huh. milieu was, was forming, and as an impressionable teen and, uh, and high schooler, yeah. you know, got into that, and Dave Arneson was very welcoming, you know, come, o- come over and play, and so we lived just on the other side of the town. That's um, fascinating. So it was, you know, it was, it was pretty cool, just, you know, purely by chance, uh, you know, happened to be right in the middle of it. So, why do you think that was? Why do you think what was it about that that concentration of people was just the community that that grew because of the welcomeness that was there? Yes, but Dave Dave Arneson and Dave Wesley are very driven individuals. They're extremely knowledgeable and they're passionate about gaming and history. Mm. And um, you know, there's a handful of other people, Ross Maker, of course, and there's Dwayne Jenkins. Where these are people who like to get together every Saturday or every other Saturday and, and game. So mm-hmm. It started out as historical, a uh, lot of miniatures, tabletop battles and that sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, the fantasy uh, developed. And then Dave Wesley uh, created the, the Bronstein uh, uh, game setting where you were actually doing role playing. And that's, that's really the genesis of uh, wow. uh, true role playing. Yeah, and so it was the fun of the role playing ins- that I think inspired Arneson further, and fantasy and the chain mail, so it kind of uh, developed in, the, in that sort of thing. So just to be a part of that was just tremendously fun and, and dynamic uh, and interesting. And, and Dave Arneson created um, a- as the uh, vehicle to, to have tabletop battles with miniature figurines, mm-hmm. Napoleonic armies. Yeah. So we're talking 1790 to 1815. Um, a lot of these guys had 25 millimeter collections of, of miniature figurines that they'd paint up, and of course that still goes on today, much yeah. to a lesser extent. <laughs> but that was all there was at, th- at you know in those days before the whole proliferation of, of gaming and options and that sort of thing. Well, anyway, Dave Arneson created a structure of a Napoleonic campaign in the Twin Cities involving 20 plus people, mm. um, and each um, person was the the leader of a partic- particular country. So England, France. Oh, neat. You know, parts of the, the, of the German uh, states. Um, Italy, of course, was fragmented. I was Carpasha, the uh, <laughs> Barbary pirate chieftain. So I had, lo- you know, the North African coast, and there was the Empire of France and Russia and so on. So the whole idea behind this concept was to um, using the, the basis of the diplomacy game where you have areas of, of Europe and you move your armies and fleets. Mm-hmm. That would be on the, the greatest, grandest tactical scale. Using that concept 
we would move fleets and armies. We created, he gave us a budget of uh, the income that your country had that you could spend for military things. You could spend for training for troops to equip them. Raising cavalry is very wow. expensive. Uh, naval ships of different sizes and so on. And then we used the don't give up the ship. Uh, naval rules, which were again being formed at oh that time. Yeah. So this whole meta game of like yeah. what it was like to play. Meta game would be a great, uh, great way to describe. It. Dave Arneson created this, and he was the game master. And this went on. Oh there were wow. two versions of it. Each version went on for two or three years. So this and involved more than twenty people. Oh and my God. So that you would you would get your budget and you'd buy your regiments or your build your ship. Yeah. Of course, it took time. Yeah. Uh, and you had to supply naval stores. You had to find out, where, especially with navies, you've got to go to Austria or England or America, where the best lumber is and timbers to make masts and that sort of thing. Yeah. So you had to plan all this. And uh, now keep in mind, the most amazing thing is not just the scope of this, but this was all before computers. You could. Yeah. Yeah. This is all was pen and paper by hand. Yeah. yeah. And we were all doing, doing the, the calculations, yeah. right? Because there had to be algorithms and stuff to figure out, like, oh, who's yeah. going to get yeah. what and, blah, blah, and, and try and to make it, just, it fair. It was amazing. So we would all, it would be it would be budget season. We'd have a couple of weeks to put our budget huh. together. I'm going to buy these ships, and we're going to equip these regiments, and we're going to train these troops. And, and you know, the more you train, the better your morale is going to be in the tabletop. Dog. So this was all a rationale so that when we started moving these fleets and armies, we could have war games to play. Uh, we would recreate that would have games. more at stake than just okay yeah, let's yeah. set up our our miniatures and knock at each other there's so much more at stake in there and i think Absolutely. those kind of through lines uh, went through and what is probably made the inspiration for for dungeons and dragons in a way yeah, right yeah and and the amazing thing is when you would move your armies and then you'd give your orders to dave arneson the judge mm -hmm. you know the french armies and the, and the british armies would be maneuvering around say Brittany or whatever yeah and then um it on a day by day sort of thing, you plot where the armies were, and you um, based on the orders the players gave him, and then when the two armies would encounter each other, he'd see where in Brittany it was, and then he went to the map library at the University of Minnesota. He would oh get a, a blow up of the Brittany area, right where these armies were That's maneuvering. So, cool. so then he, on the tabletop, they would roll out um, brown paper, and with markers oh would make the battlefield for wherever in Brittany these. Uh, I remember right, with the one right battle. terrain and yeah. the correct kind of hills. Yeah, and yeah. And it was oh, so, oh so you had this real world and this um, imaginary campaign come together. That's I remember so there was one battle at, at the town of Pontiv, P-O-N-T-I-V-Y, mm -hmm. in Brittany. Uh, you know, it's a real place, and uh, so they went and got the maps and you know put in the forests and the, the creeks and rivers and the hills, and oh, they dedication. fought the tabletop battle on a, on a table like this, or maybe a little bigger. That's great, uh, and that sort of thing. So it was a whole this whole world, but this went on and on. And you know, and I was, and there was a lot of diplomacy. You know, you'd bargain back and forth like in a game of diplomacy board game. Shelley um, has banned diplomacy. We can't play it in the office anymore. No more. Okay. Well, it's anyway, a, it's a it was shattering <laughs> uh, experience. <laughs> when it's it, was, it was based off that sort of thing. So yeah. Arneson did all of this himself, and and uh, then he uh, through through uh, uh, this is about the time IFW, the International Federation of War Gaming Club, national club, mm -hmm. putting together um, these sorts of uh, uh, groups. Uh, came up, and that's um, Gary Gygax was instrumental in IFW, uh, and, and that IFW was nominally the sponsor of the first Gen Con in 1968. So um, he you're got in Lake Geneva, yeah, right? in Lake Geneva, yep, at the Horticultural Hall. And so uh, Arneson, I think, might have been in the second campaign. I'm not sure. He had because Gygax was 300 miles away. He had Gygax be America in this oh. campaign. Oh. So he was the United States. Of course, they have a very uh, kick-ass navy in those days. Um, so in, in our European world, which was really the total folks, every once in a while these American ships would, would show up. up and you know you don't know how they're gonna how they're gonna react. Or they're That's gonna awesome. I've always wanted to play in a in a situation like that that was fantasy, right? So like you uh -huh. had you know that a same fantasy world. Yeah, a fantasy uh -huh. world, right? So it, like you'd have a leader that was the 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 wizard and he had all of his like wizard war mage core and, sure, and like sure. and then mm -hmm. but also had that same idea of like you'd have to train up, you have to, you know the economy mm -hmm. of your of your domains are as important. Uh, and uh, and if you lose a character or lose some big resource. Yeah. lose it in battle or squander it. That's huge. It, it's huge because yeah. then you don't have it for the next game. Now, in a normal one single episode game, it doesn't, you know, somebody dies or you, you know, burn up. <laughs> yeah. Lose all your But if you're talking pieces, about a three-year campaign, campaign yeah, and yeah, you exactly. lose your general, yeah, that's, that's your most, you know, yeah, yeah. skilled you, uh, leader you, on the battlefield. You had, a, tre that's you a, had big... a wonderful treasure, but you yeah. lost it. Yeah. The, then you don't have it the next three times you play. I so, love that. Yeah, so, yeah, the continuing thing and the characters. And then you start to build up the camaraderie, not just of the pl characters, but of the players. And so right. Too. So, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so uh, 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 Gary Gygax, as America, was your first kind of introduction to uh, uh, playing with him? Have you, have you, have you known yeah, him Well, time? I think I knew him before that um, through IFW. Okay. National Federation of Wargaming. Again, he's I he's several years older than than I was, 
Um, but he was very welcoming. I mean, anybody that talks about Gary Gygax will tell you how not only gregarious he was, but how hospitable and, you know, mm -hmm. very welcoming to people and, you know, just a, a great guy That's promoting cool. gaming and so on. So, um, so I knew part of my story is that I knew Dave Artisan from St. Paul and I knew Gary Gygax from Lake Geneva. So when things started to coalesce in terms of D&D &D and TSR and so on, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I knew both of them. Not Neither one as a, very, as a close friend, but as certainly as a gaming friend and, yeah. and somebody that I could, could call upon and for uh, advice or suggestions. And Gary was very welcoming. And, and, and as part of IFW, International Federation of Wargame, they had a number of different societies and groups. And um, there's the Stalingrad Society for people who played Avalon Hill Stalingrad. There was the Castle and Crusade Society, which, of course, everybody knows about as part of this history. Mm -hmm. um, Gary encouraged me. He heard that I was interested in World War I aviation and had created a game called Fight in the Skies. And so he said, oh, yeah. you should self-publish this through the WGIG, which is War Game Inventors Guild, <laughs> part of one of the societies of, of the IFW, which I did. And it started to catch on. And he liked the game, and so he was very uh, encouraging. Um, and that went through even our TSR days when TSR published that as a game and that sort of thing. Um, and so these societies were part of subgroups of the larger national organization and so on. So um, believe it or not, the Fight in the Sky Society still exists, <laughs> formed in uh, 1969. And our first newsletter was June of 1969, Aerodrome number one. And uh, so this coming summer in 2019, we're going to be publishing our 50th anniversary oh, yeah. newsletter. So it's, we have about, amazing. about 75 enthusiasts. And that's kind of a separate story, and we can cover that a little bit more. So It's really neat. Whatever. So, yeah. so Gary Gygax was, was instrumental in encouraging me as a younger gamer mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to take part and so on. And, of course, then when, when Gen Con uh, was in Gary's mind to get a gathering of, of people to come to Lake Geneva, um, he did it under the auspices nominally of the IFW, mm. the national organization, and they sent the word out in the summer of 68 that in August, uh, on the 24th, uh, Gary was hosting in Lake Geneva at the Horticultural Hall. It was going to host a one-day uh, game convention. Does that place still exist? Yes. Oh, yeah. You can go you over go and visit. visit. Yeah, we can go over there and see, see what 10 the minutes from yeah. now. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Horticultural Hall is a little sidebar here. Horticultural Hall was built, I think, around 1920 or in the 1920s, and it's the Flower Club in Lake Geneva. That's hence the name. Yeah. yeah, that's where they have their flower shows. But it's also a civic building where they can have other meetings and so on. And so there's a, a main hall, which is fairly modest in size, but also a courtyard, and then um, or surrounding the courtyard, there's covered areas. So it was perfect. So I don't know, you had to rent it for 150 bucks or whatever. <laughs> You know, um, and, you get, and how many uh, yeah. uh, people were at that first Gen Con, do you think? Um, again, the historians would say, I'd say, pr I guess, around 100. Okay. So I'm, I'm um, just short of my 17th birthday. I'm 16. I'm in St. Paul. That's 300 miles from Lake Geneva. And I hear about this. And I, this sounds pretty, this would be pretty cool. Yeah, it was during um, summer break. So you were yeah, yeah, to go, yeah, right? Yeah, So And <laughs> uh, so I asked my parents, could we maybe go to Lake Geneva? Or, you know, could we go down to Lake Geneva? It's 300 miles. Um, because I'd like to go to this gaming thing. And, and part of the selling point is Lake Geneva is a tourist town. So I said, well, it, you know, there's other things to do there. And so yeah. while I was at, it was a Saturday only, uh, Gen Con 1, uh, while I was happily spending the time at Horticulture Hall gaming uh, and running the first game, <laughs> <laughs> um, they were taking the boat crews on Lake Geneva and doing the touristy stuff you know, that my younger sister would, uh, would enjoy and that, that, that they enjoyed. So That's bless nice. my nice parents, they, they brought you. me, they brought yeah. me to Gen Con number one. So then the second year we took the train down from the Twin Cities, mm -hmm. um, the Milwaukee Road, Hiawatha, this was before pre Amtrak, right. went to uh, Milwaukee and Chicago and Gary Gygax was working at Fireman's Fund Insurance in, uh, in Chicago. So mm -hmm. we got into Chicago in the afternoon. We met up with Gary, it was when he got off work and we took the commuter train with Gary up to Lake Geneva. Um, of course, that does not exist anymore. The tra <laughs> track has long yeah. since gone and, and so on. So we came up uh, to Lake Geneva with Gary and then stayed here. And then uh, guys came from the Twin Cities. Um, and so we got ride back to Minneapolis-St. Paul oh, perfect. with, okay, with okay, them, yeah. you know, on, on uh, the day after. So then so, uh, so at the 1968 Gen Con 1, uh, what was that first game that you played? What, what was it? The first well, game after ever run. At ever run at a Gen Con. After Gary's opening remarks, welcoming everyone, Yeah. Um, I ran the first game, which was a Fight in the Skies game, uh, which is World War One dogfight, dogfight aviation right. game. Yeah. And I brought plastic, I had plastic bottles 
Um, and you were 16 at the time? Yeah, I was going to be 17 about a month. Well, a couple of weeks later. So I was just shy of my 17th birthday. Was everyone, like, were you one of the youngest people there? Or probably. Mixed? Yeah, probably. Well, it's a real mix. Just like gaming today is a real yeah. mixture of, of, of ages, you know, from teenagers up to gray beards. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to say I'm you yeah, know, right. You've, I've you've been still through around. Yeah, yep. been so through all of those stages, yeah, yeah, right? So, yeah. so I ran the first game, and, and I guess I had kind of forgotten that, but uh, John Peterson, the historian, or somebody else showed me, there was a uh, IFW newsletter from a month later in September of 68 said, you know, Gary Gygax uh, hosted a successful get-together in Lake Geneva at the Horrid Cultural Hall, and after he welcomed everyone, Mike Carr ran the first game. So it's in print. It's in print. It's real. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other cool thing is that uh, I've never missed a Gen Con since then. So not only was it gratifying to be at number one, but I've kept that streak going That's through amazing. 51 years. So um, my how it's changed oh probably since yes, that yes, first yes. That's Gen a whole nother Con. Yeah. Subject, but <laughs> after right. And you've been at every single Gary Con, correct? Yes. Yeah. This is number 11. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to Luke, and you know, it, it really helps that I'm only 40 miles away from Lake Geneva yeah. now. So. I imagine this, the first Gary Con was probably a little bit reminiscent of that first Gen Absolutely. Con. It yeah. really was. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think the first one was at the Legion Hall. Oh, really? Where I think maybe Gen Con 3 or 4 had been at the American Legion Hall in Lake wow. Geneva. Because, mm. you know, there was only 100 So many buildings to do these other things. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, it was a modest number of attendees. So uh, the Legion Hall was, I think, the host for one of the early ones. And then during the TSR days, the Legion Hall was the host site for uh, Winter Fantasy. Oh and, yeah, and the Fall Revel, uh, which were like little mini cons um, to break up the year in addition to Gen Con. So, yeah, it was it was, you know, quite amazing. And when the fortieth Gen Con was approaching, uh, they were going to do a book. And um, Robin Laws, I think, was was the uh, uh, editor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they said, well, you should talk to Mike. You should talk to Mike Carr. He's apparently been to the the Gen Con. So, the editorial team contacted me and said, do you, you know, we understand you have been at Gen Con all these years. And I said, yeah. Um, do you have any photos from the early days? And I said, I'm embarrassed to say I, all these, you know, 39 years that I've attended, I have very few pictures. I said, but I know I have some black and whites from when I was a teenager from the early days. So oh, wow. fortunately, they were still in the attic and I found them. And it was oh, about wow. seven. I had a, a kind of a crummy, cheapo camera that you would have for a teenager. Yeah. It was yeah. a brownie flash fun <laughs> camera. Um, and it was black and white, and I had probably six or seven of these of these photos, which were, to be honest, quite unremarkable photos. Um, and I told them, I said, I have photos, but they're kind of unremarkable, nothing special. And well, we'd, well, we'd certainly like to see them. And I said, well, of course. So, um, and I remembered the names of a fair number of people that were in the picture, which is surprising. It was 40 years, 35 plus years later. Yeah. Um, and so I captioned all these photos and sent them in, and they were delighted. Well, then the book comes out, and it turns out those are the only pictures they had from the really early days. Oh, wow. Now, subsequent to that book, other people have come forward and said, we have some we early, have some, early yeah. pictures. And but it was hard to find those to be yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, supposedly there was a Milwaukee uh, TV station that came down and they shot some footage and... and of the first Gen Con or, or well, one, one of the early three. ones, yeah, okay. yeah. Interesting. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of hard to tell them apart because they're all at the first ones were at Horticultural Hall. One of the early ones was at Williams Bay, which is on the other side of the, just down the, down the lake at George Williams College that was one time there and of mm -hmm. course here at the, what was the Playboy Resort now Grand Geneva that was Gen Con 10 was here was here right um, and that was pretty legendary as well so yeah um, so the the book came out and um, Peter Atkinson by that time was um, you know the, the Gen Con maven and still is as, yeah. as owner of Gen Con yeah and so he he very graciously said to me he said I, I heard from the people putting the book together that you were very instrumental in providing some information and uh, photos and so on he said and i understand you're the only person that's been at every gen con so i want to offer you as long as i own and run the convention i want to offer you a free lifetime pass oh, oh no so that's so awesome. I, I said i i very happily accept your gracious offer so <laughs> um you know it's, it's you, a wonderful you, you were also a, a, a lifetime subscription to uh dungeons and dragons whenever yeah, you needed yeah, uh, yeah. any kind of uh, breakfast cereal you got a lifetime supply uh, as well yeah, yeah so uh <laughs> you know a lot of uh, I'll be honest, a lot of my uh, uh, history is being in the right place at the right time and knowing the right people, but it's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience, and it still is to this time. Yeah, so, it's amazing. Um, it's still so going. The, the TSR days were remarkable. The early days in Dave Arneson's basement were great. Uh, you know, meeting Gary Gygax and playing with, uh, with him, and the, the, I was involved 
the other project that Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson did was this Don't Give Up the Ship mm -hmm. Naval Battle Rules uh, right. for naval miniatures. And so I was the editor for that. So I got my name on that with Arneson, nice. Gygax, and Carr. Uh, and in fact, this afternoon, I'm going to be running a game of Don't Give Up the Ship oh, no, really? with 20 probably 15. I, lo I love that Gary Kahn awesome. pays tribute to the wargaming roots uh, well, a lot, you know, because obviously that's where that's where all this kind of came from and yeah. it, we evolved from. And I'd love to, uh, uh, you know, obviously talk about uh, uh, that game, but um, what I really want to pick your brain around is like that transition. Like how did it happen from going from these miniature war games into what we now consider Dungeons and Dragons? Well, I think it was a natural transition. Um, in those days, there were very few games. Um, Avalon Hill Game Company was the, not just premier, <laughs> but the only company publishing. I mean, diplomacy was games research, and but that was kind of a one, yeah. one off sort of thing. Um, so the desire in those days was for more gaming. As as people played Avalon Hill games and and, and liked them, they were, there was a hunger for more than one a year. Avalon Hill would publish a, a game in the spring, and hopefully you liked the topic. <laughs> and uh, if you did, you you, you were wait good. A year. But you had to wait a <laughs> year for the next one. Yeah, and if you didn't like it, you had to still had to wait another we year. We still so do that. There was a natural. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's still kind of true about games now. There was there was a natural desire for more, and that's why the IFW and what Gary was behind the War Game Inventors Guild and let's we got all these talented gamers who have yeah. a passion and an interest, and in a lot of uh, cases, very deep knowledge. I mean, Dave Wesley, for instance, uh, you know, is, he lectures, and he was a military officer, and he lectures on artillery, right. and then he's, the guy's a, a polymath, in a way, in terms of he knows all these things. So we have all these people with all this creative ability and passion that could be creating more games than just the one that's coming out every year from Baltimore. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, the, the part of your, the answer to your question is there was a desire for more, uh, and more topics, and more... Um, interesting challenges and so on. And, and of course, it, the earliest was tabletop miniatures, um, and then board war games with hex maps. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and then, then role playing came, um, and, and the Bronstein game that Dave Wesley created was really kind of the first role playing game that mm -hmm. a lot of people uh, uh, should, should take more interest in than I think that do. And, and, and Dave Wesley comes here to GaryCon and he runs Bronstein. There's several oh, versions wow. early of it. And um, yeah, I'd love to pick this I've told that. And a couple times he didn't he didn't fill it. And I've told people who are avid avid D and D people, I said, you should be coming to GaryCon and you should play Bronstein because Bronstein is the actual genesis. It's the 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 whole start of this concept. It was mm. uh, we we each play a role and we interact yeah. personally. And there's no there's no heavy structure of rules or whatever. There's a judge and people confer with the judge and they're bargaining and the judge has set up a situation where you know different characters have different motivations and yeah. this is um that 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 was Bronstein. that was dave wesley was the genesis of the idea so i tell people who are if you're an avid D, &D player that you love to play D, &D and you'd travel to do it i said you ought to be pl people ought to be knocking down the door to play because dave yeah. wesley the, the guy from 1970 or is is here and he's running Bronstein. It's like if you love D and D, you ought to this be. You, ought to, yeah. you know, and all of us old timers are not going to be around forever. You <laughs> got to be. If you love D and D, you ought to be coming and play Bronstein at at Gary Con or wherever Dave or With Wesley Dave, would happen yeah. to run it because it takes all day. That's really um, neat because I, really I mean I guess that's what I'm asking is that yeah. connective tissue because you know, I always heard about you know war gaming and it was not thought of as. Um, I mean, I, I obviously, the metagame mm -hmm. you're talking about, where sure. each, each sure. person is playing a different country, yep. you are a little bit assuming a role of the leader of that country, right? Yes, but it's absolutely. never yeah. as personal as you're talking about. It's like, right. oh, we're, we're going to be in the same room as the leader of Russia and the leader of yeah. England and the leader of France and no negotiate together. Like, that was never part of that game, I don't think, right? Right. Um, so what was that tissue to go from like, okay, you're playing as an army or a, a, a group of people whose only objective is to, you know, defeat the other army, mm -hmm. to I am playing as a wizard or a cleric or a fighter. Well, that's and, where and the Bronstein, I think. And that sounds like that yeah. is the connective tissue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's why I'm uh, such a promoter of Bronstein in history. I mean, I, and, and I was there, and it, it was, we could see it was something different. Yeah. Uh, and then Dave Arneson participated, he loved he loved Bronstein, what they came up with. And uh, then so we used that for, for Blackmore. Well, yeah, and then the, the whole role-playing thing started to gather momentum in that, and, and, and it just struck a chord with people, and it, it still does. I yeah. mean, it's just, um, and you know, it, what, what really threw the traditional world off is, a, is there's no set heavy structure of rules. It's like, you can't say there's no rules, 
but it's very, very free form, and, and the players can pretty much do or attempt anything, mm -hmm. you know, wise or unwise or crazy or yeah. whatever. So it's varying degrees of success. Yeah. So I think that's what that, that so that started to move this this passion for gaming. Uh, suddenly had a, had new life and new dimensions to it, and I think I think that's the answer to your question. So this whole opened up yeah. endless possibilities, mm -hmm. which we're still seeing. And then, of course, this was all before video games and computers. But when they came along, that further expanded this Positive world and the, the you know that's uh, the expanding universe, if I can use that analogy uh, <laughs> of, of of the gaming world. The and, Big and Bang moment. Yeah, exactly. You were there yeah, for exactly. it. You were there, there for it. So. Um, yeah, and it was gr tremendously gratifying. I mean, at the time, you know, you're a kid, or you're, you're hi high school, college, and I'm, I happened, I, I was in the nexus of this whole world, and, you know, at the time, you don't really, re it's just a hobby, you're playing with right. friends and people that you know, and you're meeting yeah. new people. Um, so what's it like now looking back at, at those times and, and realizing how that was the genesis of all this? I guess the first thing is how lucky I was to be <laughs> in the right place at the right time. And yeah. I, I knew Dave Arneson and I knew Gary Gygax. And again, there's uh, I've been interviewed a number of times and, and a lot of people knew Dave and a lot of people knew Gary, but I'm one of the ones that, uh, and Mike Menard would be another one, mm -hmm. uh, who, who kind of knew both and you know, had, a, had a feel for that uh, in both, in both uh, senses. And they were both... Uh, wonderful gentlemen and and great game masters and so imaginative and mm. detail oriented and and just a delight to play in games with them especially a game that they were running yeah uh, and so I was I guess to answer your question I, I just consider myself extremely fortunate to have been in that um, time and place and that milieu and even now today looking back you know um, I'm considered one of the handful of old guard people at uh, at Gary Con, and you know that, that's a, uh, I guess, a semi-prestigious honor to do that. <laughs> that's very sure. prestigious. Yeah, yeah. yeah there so, you uh, are. yeah, you're so, um, there forever. So I'm proud of that, and but just really blessed. And and I've made so many friends over the whole course yeah. of my life through this hobby and mm. through the Fight in the Skies and Dawn Patrol game and, and and so on. So it's just been very gratifying. So extremely appreciative of the opportunities I've had and the people I've met and. You know, TSR growing up, I was able to kind of get in on the ground floor of, of that. Right. And I, you know, I, have, I, I tell people I had a ringside seat for the whole Dungeons and Dragons phenomenon and was part of that and the yeah, B, you were B1 a module part of and that. all that stuff. So, Did you know, so, like, ever have a thought when you were a 16 year old kid playing these games that, like, this is something you could actually make a career out of? Uh, not at that really point. No, that, that later, that moment came uh, in, in 19. Late 1975, when you know, TSR had started in Lake Geneva, Tactical Studies Rules and Don Kay and Gary Gygax, you know, started this enterprise um, very modestly, with publishing some rule books for miniatures. Um, when Gary said, uh, you know, we're expanding in Lake Geneva, would you like to come and work with us? This was late 75. Um, and I had graduated in 1973 from McAllister College in St. Paul with a degree in history. I was hoping to be a teacher, but there were no teaching jobs. <laughs> I mean, I was going to teach social studies, and uh, that, that, that didn't happen. So no regrets, as, as it yeah. turned out. But um, uh, my uh, college job was I worked at the Ground Round Restaurant um, oh, yeah, in, in, in Roseville, Minnesota, up, up the street uh, from uh, McAllister College. The ground Round. And, mm -hmm. uh, free popcorn. I was, yeah, free popcorn and peanuts oh, uh, back man. in the day. No peanuts anymore. Okay, no, not anymore. Just That's popcorn. true. Just popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> is that still true now? You can yeah. still get free popcorn now? Yeah, I ate a few, re few weeks ago. I ate at a ground round for the first time in quite a few years. Uh, they went <laughs> it was like a reunion at <laughs> the old <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. They, I, I, came together. Yeah, yeah, so. You were at the first ground round ever. <laughs> yeah. well, it was, I've been at every ground round <laughs> since. <laughs> it was The one that I did work at was the, the number two in no the chain. No way. Yeah. In Roosevelt. Well, anyway, I was at, during college, it was a, a, a broiler cook. That yeah. was my college job to help you know, for tuition and that sort of thing. So I graduated, and there were no teaching jobs, and so I th I, I, what prospects do I have? Um, I asked, could I go into the management training program? Mm -hmm. Of course, my dad says, well, you got a degree, a college degree, now what are you going to do? Right. So, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, I could game for a little it. while, but after six months, you know, it's like I got a show of progress towards something. Yeah. Um, so I asked, could I go in the management training program? So they said, yes, if you'll go to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Well, I, I don't want to say bad things about Cedar Rapids, but I was not real happy there. And, and but I went, th you know, I think maybe they couldn't find anybody else to go to Cedar Rapids, mm. so I, I said, yeah, I'll go be a management trainee there. So even though I was hoping to, so they were training trainees in the Twin Cities, and I thought they were coming through this location where I was working in the kitchen, uh, so I assumed that's I could train there. Well, would you go to Cedar Rapids? Well, take her to leave it. So I, I took it. I went to Cedar Rapids for two years. Mm -hmm. um, 
learned a few things. And, and Gary, at this time, we were corresponding and said, you know, now that you have some management experience and we're expanding our s s modest company, you know, would you like to come and work for us? Right. So I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. I love the restaurant business, but it's six days a week, and I had Tuesdays off, and you can't have a yeah. social life. And, you know, but I was young and single, and um, et cetera. That's the so time to be in that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so in March of 76, I came to Lake Geneva. Now, in the restaurant business, I had worked my way up to $205 a week um, as a trainee. Uh, and Gary said, we can pay you $110 a week if you'll come, you know, to work for us. Um, and, but we'll, we'll give you some stock in the company, and if this enterprise turns out to be prosperous, the stock will be worth something. And mm -hmm. I've always, as, even as a teenager, been uh, uh, interested in the stock market, so I know that that, that was actually could good possibly deal. turn into something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it did uh, in the long run. You know, I worked there for seven years, and that stock became very worth, you know, worthwhile to have. Uh, in the long run, and et cetera. So um, that was absolutely the case. But I took, in essence, almost a 50% pay cut to come. To but, it, but again, yeah. you're young and single and going yeah. to family. And I mean, people would do that now. I mean, yeah. I, there's yeah. there's folks that I, I know would jump at the chance to, to jump that thing. Obviously, there's, that can be exploited in right, many right, other ways, right. too. Right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, there's, there's, there's that passion there, and I think people uh, love to do uh, anything that would involve uh, gaming as a their passion, yeah, it's a hobby. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I jump and and uh, anything better than working six days a week and having Tuesdays off. So. Right. So now you're working, doing something. Now you're working seven days yeah. a week at uh, TSO. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I love <laughs> doing you know, seventy-hour yeah, work yeah. weeks. That's everyone loves that. <laughs> so in March of seventy-six, that's what brought me to Lake Geneva, and that went until nineteen eighty-three, uh, July of eighty-three. That so that was just. Over and you said, did you uh, take on a role as a manager? Uh, well, at TSO? The, yeah, I was. The, I think I was the seventh employee. Oh wow! Um, and in those days, we were, you know, it was so small. You were doing everything, um, but yeah, I was starting to to do that. And you know, the idea of the dungeon hobby shop was taking shape. And, mm -hmm. and uh, briefly, uh, my title was general manager. Um, but then later, I went more in. Uh, uh, not much later, but uh, pretty soon after that, I went into the creative side of things. With a, I was games and rules editor, and then uh, running that operation for a while. Cool. Um, before other people took over. So I had a number of hats, and then when they started manufacturing, they asked me, w you know, would you be vice president of manufacturing? And I was getting away from the creative side, and I, I, at first I turned it down, but Gary Gygax personally said, Mike, we'd like you to do this. Mm. And I said, well, I, would, I, would, I, I will, you know, for the good of the company and so on. So, because that was overseeing that we're going to take in a lot of production in house. Um, assembling the games and creating, you know, certain things, and maybe could manufacture game boards, and so they had kind of grandiose ideas to do this, and so, and then I was always a liaison with the with the printing companies and that sort of thing, you know, getting the cost estimates for printing right. jobs and all and that. How stuff. much a box so costs? And yeah, how much so I, I turned it down at first, and, and he uh, he prevailed. So you know, you know, Mike, we'd like you to do this, and and I mean, geez, I owed everything to Gary and coming to that at that point. So okay, so then I was head of uh, manufacturing for a while, and then. Um, was involved in doing the um, uh, children's books um, as an author, writing a couple of, wrote, wrote Robbers and Robots was one of the Endless Quest books. You wrote one of the Endless Quest books? Yeah, it was the one that tied in with Top Secret Robbers and Robots. Oh, yeah, cool. That's cool. Awesome. Yeah, it was cool. So, yeah. um, so I wore a lot of hats and did a lot of different yeah. things. Oddly and enough, and it's not that different now in Dungeons yeah. & Dragons. There's yeah. too many hats on all of our heads <laughs> at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really expanding. I mean, you know, being the seventh employee and now I mean, at the peak, it was almost 300 employees, I think. Right, here in Lake oh, Geneva, yeah. which yeah, was, yeah. Uh, you know, we were just talking to Luke Gygax here, yeah. and it was like it's the largest employer here in this town. For a brief while it was, yeah. And, they, and, and uh, the management of TSR, which was Gary Gygax and Brian Bloom and Kevin Bloom, they were the triumvirate. Um, more and more they wanted to bring more vertical integration, so let's, um, they were, I think, uh, they were kind of annoyed by the fact that these miniature, you know, lead miniature figurine companies were, we're making all these Dungeons and Dragons, uh, you know, not just characters, but monsters and stuff like that. I think it kind of, you know, they kind of felt like that these ours. companies are riding yeah. on the coattails, yeah. which in a sense they were. So we should, you know, we should do lead casting and let's hire uh, sculptors and let's do all but this But that's a whole other business line. That yeah, yeah. But it, it got do. kind of, uh, you know, that turned out to be uh, unwise because then they had the expenses just went. Whoosh. And then it, when, the, when the sales started to, to tail off, you know, then there was a squeeze, and that was 1982, 83. Right. Um, and so I was put out on the street <laughs> with uh, with 200 others. Oh um, no. You know, over there was we called them waves. First wave of layoffs, second, third. I think it was right. might be in the third wave of layoffs. Um, 
but it was uh, so that was kind of a sad. Time. It was a hard time to. to yeah, to yeah, and it, it, the, the interesting thing, and you know, we all hear the the cliche that when one door closes, another door opens. Yeah. Um, but I remember uh, the day I was packing up my stuff from my desk, and you know, because I had been let go. Um, Alan Hammock came up to me and he said, "Aren't you? Aren't you a little upset? Are you were one of the early people that Gary brought here, and you know, and you worked for se- here for seven years, and you were instrumental in all of this." And and I kind of put a brave face on. I said, "Well, you know, Alan, I I no no hard feelings about it. I said I understand the realities of the business world, and mm-hmm. and I said, you know, sometimes when one door closes, another door opens. Well, that was you know purely a, an aphorism, <laughs> but that absolutely turned out to be true. Uh, some weeks later, I picked up a copy of the Wall Street Journal. I went to the news agency in Lake Geneva, which was the magazine store, and I hadn't picked up the Wall Street Journal for six months before that particular day, and it was Tuesday when the job ads ran, and there was an ad for Commodity Futures Trader in Chicago, <laughs> and I had proposed doing a game on Commodity Futures Trading at TSR. It didn't happen, but mm-hmm. I had gone to Milwaukee, and uh, they, uh, a commodities broker taught a four-week, four-night, four-Wednesday nights, two-hour thing, so I had a clue about the business and stuff, and that led to a, another fantastic uh, experience trading commodities in Chicago with one of the legendary traders there. Wow. And I've been interviewed separately about that experience. So not is only do I have a ringside seat wow, for Dungeons and Dragons, but I became part of this is group. Amazing. Isn't that also the movie Turtles. Trading Places? Well, it's similar to that sort of thing. Where yeah. I, yeah. And that was, that was Chicago, was too, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, anyway. Um, Interesting. This, uh, you know, uh, losing my job at TSR, I always uh, was, was, was really sad for me because... As Alan pointed out, it was one of the early people. Yeah. Right, number seven. Higher number out, seven. That's crazy. I mean, this divine intervention. I went one day, and that was the one day that that ad ran, and yeah. that was a life change in, in in a very positive, other sense. So I had you know totally different uh, careers, and so I've just been blessed time and again. Yeah. And after that ran its course, I was doing freelance writing, and I was writing for a magazine, and they said, "Would you like to interview CEOs of companies about themselves and their company?" So yeah, I'll be happy to do that. That led to a, uh, you know, I hit it off with the CEO, and uh, they offered me a job as manager of marketing and communications, and did that for, oh for my seven God. eight years. Um, and uh, it's just, I've been, again, as I said before, I've been in the right place at the right time. Yeah. You know, and the good Lord's watched over me, and uh, uh, it's just, you know, it's been an amazing, you know, I, as I reflect on my life, it's like I had a, all these amazing experiences. Hopefully, many more to still come. Yes, of course. But uh, if not, it was just, it's just been remarkable. Don't hit my camera, shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> just kidding. you saw that? <laughs> yeah, it moved a little bit. But luckily, it wasn't on, so you're all good. Okay, safe. Sorry. Uh, no, so, I'm just okay. kidding. Uh, but I, th- th- there's a lot of uh, parallels, I think, with a lot of people who are gamers yes. with what you're talking about because, you know, it, it become their passion and their hobby. And then some people that they might know through uh, Absolute, a, a strange thing ends yeah. up being the person that offers them a job later yeah. on. And then you end up mm-hmm. having these, these, these stories of their, of their lives that uh, doesn't really trace any kind of through line other than. Being in the right place at the right time, yeah, and networking and is really. And then this is, a, you know, if any a life young, if any young all. people will listen to me, I, <laughs> I always say networking is tremendously important. Yeah, um, and, being a and, good communicator. And one of the things I tell young people is write write thank you notes. Actually, yeah, everybody wants to email or I'll text yeah. you a thank yep. you or whatever. So if somebody yeah. interviews you or whatever, um, you know, send send them a written handwritten note. Yeah, said, because that's so rare today. It really that is. when, you know, and, and and people who are in the world of business or uh, meet a lot of people, you know, if they get a handwritten note of thanks and you know they're going to remember you mean something. over yeah. the other yeah. 49 people they met in the last two weeks um and then the other thing i tell young people is ask older people for advice because a they're flattered that anybody would care but you might actually really <laughs> gain some wisdom yeah and 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 then when you ask older people for advice they're often willing to help you or, or refer you to so and so and and so if you're right. interested in a particular career field or whatever it never hurts to ask you know, and a lot of people are hesitant to do that. But I love that you're giving advice as an old person to ask old people for <laughs> advice. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is a self-serving piece of advice. It, but, isn't it's, it? it's, but it's really get a true. Lot of emails. And, <laughs> and, and yeah, a lot of emails. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, and people are flattered. You know that, that somebody would. It care. is true. Yeah. And, it and is young very people, true. Um, you know, they they um, they can benefit from that if they yeah. you know if they're wise. So there's a lot of there's a lot of shared wisdom uh, in in the world out there, and I think it's, uh, well, it's another thing I was going to say, kind of related to that, is when you are a gamer and a role-playing gamer. You are presented with challenges. If you have limited resources, you're thrown together with other players and yeah. characters. Um, you have a uh, challenge or quest ahead of you, or whatever. You have limitations. You have certain resources. You got to kind of figure out collectively and on your own how you're going to tackle this. Yeah. Now, I would I'd be the first to say that you can approach your life that way. I mean, if you're in the tenth grade and you've got you know 
college choices, you know, what, where are you located and what are your family resources or lack of them, who are your friends, who are your mentors, and that sort of thing. Uh, if, if you think like a gamer, you can, you can actually advance yourself, I think, because you yeah. can approach it in a more methodical way. And that's one of the things gaming teaches you, mm -hmm. cooperation and the value of working with others or using contacts or resources and that sort of thing. So I think role-playing game for young people is, is tremendously It's like helpful. life training in a way. Yes. Right? It really is, but, and, and it's all um, uh, you know, in the background. You, you, right. You're learning this, and but you may tell not them even that, be Because then they won't want to play. It's true, yeah, we shouldn't, we we shouldn't say it. But it is, I mean, it's like every really group does. project you did in school or anything like that, it was always like, <laughs> okay, how do you work together? How are you gonna use different skills? Yeah. People have uh, different strengths, so let's lean on them. On, and, yeah, and, yeah. and that's, and, and, that's you know, D&D to a to Going to college and choosing your college, and then when you get to college, what are your challenges? And yeah. you know, I mean, there's all the college then, of wizardry. Which one? How are you, gonna you going to meet <laughs> if you if you want to have a life mate? How are you going to you know how are you going to get in a position where you are going to meet quality um, people of the opposite sex right. to 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 be in that world and maybe you know you can uh, you or know, whoever is going to be your partner exactly. whether whatever gender yeah, yeah. they yeah. end up you being. can evaluate your partner just like on a, you're yeah. ev evalu evaluating your fe fellow characters on a, you know, on a <laughs> right, exactly on do a, we want to bring on this on cleric along yeah. all right I guess <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, but I cool. is a good way and to I uh, try out to audition to see how like people really are in real life yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a good abs point right absolutely true yeah. and, and is I that how is that how it worked for you I actually don't like playing D&D &D with Bart. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably good we didn't until after we were. That's right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I say it in, with tongue in cheek, but there's truth to it. I yeah. Mean, it really is. So I think role-playing gaming fits you to be uh, more successful in life, or at least to, to be more analytical about your situation and your resources. Yeah. And, and when you have a setback in, in your real life, you can you know kind of step back and, and assess these things. Oh, well, I could do this or I could do that, and you know I can, you know, pursue this avenue or talk to so-and-so about such and such. And you know, it, it's just, I think, helps you to do that. And, and uh, I, I think like a gamer, I always, t uh, when we're, my wife and I are driving to downtown Milwaukee and we're gonna go to a concert, where we're looking for parking. And so how much time do we have before we have to be at the venue? And I, you yeah. know, I call it the parking game. We're gonna, we're gonna, we, oh, we got 10 minutes. We can kind of start, she calls yeah. it, she calls it sharking around, uh, <laughs> looking for looking for a parking spot. And at, at a certain point after 10 minutes, all right, now we got to go to the ramp and pay the, pay yep. the 10 bucks yep. or whatever. But yeah. we, we're looking for a free street place or uh, something like that sort of thing. So this gaming mentality, um, again, t I say that tongue in cheek, but there's a little truth to it. It's like no, there totally approach, is. approach different things in a fun way. It's like, yeah. oh, God, how are we going to find parking? That's going to be a pain. But right, that can like, be very oh, no, stressful in yeah. many so relationships. Well, we got 10 yeah. minutes here. Let's try this. And you know, half, the time, half the time you win. So. Um, I, I digress a bit, but I think that's where gaming really is. It's just a wonderful hobby, and it's just a, a great cooperative activity. Yeah. And it's a personal challenge, and it's very gratifying. It's a, it can be so. a great career. And yeah. did you guys know that back then? You know, because I think that's something that's really interesting. Now we talk a lot about the uh, uh, the benefits of, of the game, all the soft skills that you <laughs> learn, as well as you know uh, a, a passion for history and learning oh. about things. Um, but I don't. I, I'm not sure if that was necessarily. Uh, uh, and maybe you can tell me, was that like part of the, the shtick when, when you were trying to sell it to, to folks who may be a little bit less uh, interested in a, you know, a fantasy role playing game before that was what it is? Obviously, there, you, you were right around that time where there was this negative uh, uh, sure, thoughts sure. about the game. Uh, I would say yes. And in the um, parallel that we would use in those days, it's like, it's like an unfolding novel mm. where you are one of the characters. You know, yeah. people like to read novels. Everybody right. enjoys that. Um, but in you know the parallel that they make is in in, uh, in a role playing game in Dungeons and Dragons whether it's Dungeons and Dragons Top Secret Boot Hill or whatever you are one of the primary characters, and the story is unfolding as you take actions and, and encounter other people or, or situations that sort of thing. So um, that that's a way that you can kind of put it in the in the um, Context con that common uh, experience that people can identify with, and that and that's helpful. And then, yeah. oh, okay, that's what it is. Do people believe you? I mean, do they were yeah, like, oh, that makes sense. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the way, at least can understand what this concept, well, what do you mean there's no rules, there's no board? I mean, it's like, huh? Yeah. So uh, yeah, a lot of people are that, are that way. People. So that's kind of the analogy that I would often use. It, well, it's like an unfolding novel, and you know, you're one of the main characters. And uh, when I worked at the Ground Round, um, the restaurant in Cedar Rapids, um, sometimes people complain about this and that, or oh, I got to got to work, you know, tomorrow and whatever. And I and I said, I think your your uh, attitude, your mindset, you know, is a little off. I said you you should view this restaurant where we all work, the 25 of us that are in the staff here in the kitchen and in the front of the uh, front of the place, and 
uh, wait staff and the managers and all this and the customers. I said, you would, uh, every time you come to work, you're, you're in a situation, uh, whether it's a situation comedy or you're in a continuing episode, you're like in a series, you're one of the characters, and all the people you work with are other characters in the series. And you come to work, you don't know what's going to happen or some customer you know, gets rowdy or whatever, has to be thrown out. And Excellent so there's, I said, you know, every view coming to work as a new episode, if you can. And, and a couple people said, you know, that's really improved my, my, my whole thought. Like I'm more entertained this. by my job now yeah. than I ever was. I never looked at it that way. It's yeah. like I was complaining about this. And that Have you ever seen the movie? Uh, it's called Waiting. It's set. No. It's kind of like a day in the life of okay. a of a of a restaurant, not unlike the ground round. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a fictional one. I think it's called Shenanigans. Is the okay. name of the of the restaurant. Uh, but it takes that kind of concept. It's all of these like weird characters. All these weird characters, people. and they have this uh, this kind of thing where they get back at each other uh, in an odd way. Like you know, there would always be pranks and stuff happening in restaurants. Um, and one of the characters is basically like it's this this prank that we're doing to each other is uh-huh. is what has made this a fun place to work mm-hmm. and, and ongoing so and it's yeah, ongoing yeah, and it's yeah. created this camaraderie uh-huh. and he basically says all of what you're just saying is like uh-huh. we've we've made it into this this entertainment for us that makes this entire experience enjoyable and, yeah and my point is that's the gamer mentality yeah. in, in me that would 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 proffer that we kind so of bring I, that right for sure so I think that's something that well I think we'd be remiss in not at least mentioning when you were on the creative side at okay. TSR that you uh, uh, you you wrote at least one one very prominent adventure. Yes, the B1 module. B1 yeah. module. Yeah, when the when the basics, well, Dungeons Dragons was successful, of course, as we all know, kind of I don't know, at that essentially time. out of the gate. But then uh, Random House starts, you know, the big thing was, well, let's get, if we can get Random House to distribute it, it'll be a big thing, and it was. Um, but it was still overly complex for the general audience, so the idea was, let's come up with a basic set that people can buy and have everything in the box. And uh, that was successful, but they, it was... There was a need for a module or something to get people going initially, so the uh, discussion was we should create a basic module for basic Dungeons and Dragons that uh, would be suitable. And that was and the, the blue beginning. box, right? Is that what? The, is that what? Yeah, that there basic was a blue sales? and a red box version, I think. Yeah, but the yeah. red one came later, I think, right? Okay. Or, but and so yeah, I just remember because I had, I think I had that that blue box as a child with the with the okay. uh, with the blue. And cover I'm not the sure. Box. I think maybe the one came without the module early, but mm. then right away they, you know, we got to put something in here. So to give them something to play. Yeah, and and so I raised my hand and said I would like to I'd like to take a shot at creating a basic module. Um, now, keep in mind, I was not and have never been an uh, avid, deep, uh, deep into Dungeons & Dragons player. You were on the more uh, the uh, history yeah, of the Wargaming side. Yeah, and, and, uh, but I was also there at the creation and um, edited a lot of material prior to that point uh, as, as games and rules editor. And um, this was right about the time of the AD&D books were, were coming out. So I said, I'd like to, I'd, I, you know, I raised my hand, so I'd like to take a, a crack at this. Yeah. At creating a basic module, and I think the fact that I was not real I deep was into it say that. I think that's really what makes it perfect. Yeah, really helped um, because I lacked the deep knowledge. I mean, I, I, I had I had fairly deep knowledge because I was editing a lot of the stuff that, that Gary and the others were were creating, um, but I could approach it from somebody that was come new to it. You know, yeah. where you really kind of started at, at square one and mm-hmm. explained this that, and, and um, I had enough familiarity with dungeons and designs and stuff that I, I w- was going to create. It's the only dungeon I've ever created. <laughs> was and the it's D- an w- iconic one. These, well, yeah, and that was, but who knew? But I know. Yeah, uh, so I really put, a, so well, first of all, thank goodness they said, all right, you know, we'll, we'll give you a shot at this. We, we trust your creative ability. And to, so I, I put a, and I, I said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this on the side and, uh, you know, I'm going to work on it in the evenings and stuff, not part of my normal <laughs> daily routine, so <laughs> outside. Um, so many parallels to now. Yeah. And, um, so I put Said a tremendous before. amount, yep. of, tre- tremendous amount of thought and brainstorming into it. What could I put in here? And you know, it's and of course it's low level, so you're really limited to the number of what they can do, what you can, yeah. what they, the characters can do, but also you, your monsters can't be overly fearsome or deadly or whatever. Yeah. And then you know, how do you create a dungeon? How you know, what do you, um, how do you approach that? So. Um, I designed a two-level dungeon. This is in search of the unknown, and uh, come up with a backstory, which was Zeligar and Rogan were were legendary adventurers back in the day, and they were very successful, and, and they had uh, turned back the barbarian hordes and earned the admiration of the local populace. Uh, and then they had found this place, Plus Quinton, uh, which is uh, people ask me where did that name come from. Well, there's a pl- there's an actual place in Iowa called Plus Oh, so this is your Cedar Rapids, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 experience coming in. I know. 
And Class Queen, I've definitely heard that so many times. It feels like this otherworldly place. It's just place the name. It doesn't exist in ours. No, it's in Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, now I have not been to Class Queen, but I, now it's in, in my later years. I want to go there. Apparently, there's a county park there, and it is a rocky promontory, which is similar to, oh at least God. coincidental, but um, to, to the, the setting of the B1 module. And stuff. Yeah. So, so created this whole backstory. Um, and then I designed the dungeon and um, had certain features in there. Um, you, you come in the front door and then there's a back way and it's part of this rocky hill and it's all built out inside of this thing. Um, and then, you know, what am I going to put in there to make it interesting? And uh, created fictional characters. I think there's 12 characters in each thing. Came up with these, you know, odd odd names that, you know, had looked Just like other them. Iowa cities? Yeah. <laughs> 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 one is named Cedar, one's Rapids. Cracky the hooded Dead one is one of the characters. <laughs> like Cracky. That, so. But come up with a backstory. And then um, and numerous people have complimented me. A guy, in fact, just a couple days ago, he says, I love the rumors thing. So there's like 20 rumors, and the dungeon master takes each player separately aside and says, here's what you know about this place. Roll oh, that's I mean, really rolls cool. one to 20. There's... All right, you heard that yeah. um, they, you know, they lived here and they're going to be coming back sometime soon. Okay, and then the next guy comes in, and the next player, and here's what you've heard. And of course, they're all here. Hear, everybody's hearing different rumors, that's or they might so hear cool. the same one if they roll the same die uh, result on the twenty side. Or right. And so, of course, and that's something that's used. I mean, we just did yeah. that in Dungeon yeah. and Mad Mage. So the idea that like, oh, these player characters have learned stuff along the way. And yeah. So, and of course, it's random. What? Who knows what? Or maybe two people know the same thing. Yeah. The, you know, and, and of course, some of them are <laughs> false, and some of them are. So ambiguous as to be meaningless. More, yeah, yeah. or you puzzle over them more than anything. Right, or you make up a story for yeah. it. Yeah. So I put that in, and then and, and um, you know what, what uh, designed the dungeon. The ra it had to be a rationale for the whole place and why it was designed the way it was, and the living quarters and the the where the hired help was and where the guards were, and mm -hmm. um, and then you know uh, how's the water drain through this thing, and where's the kitchen, and you know how does the smoke go out, you know, oh for cooking and. And then the lower level was, was more of a, a true dungeon uh, where, you know, it's rocky um, uh, warrens and that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, and then come up with the whole the story. And, um, and then uh, each room, and, and this is part of the teaching experience, was that you, the dungeon master, the new, you, the brand new dungeon master, here's a list of treasures, here's a list of monsters, here's all the rooms, and you can assign monsters and treasures to these rooms as you want. Of course, it's never going to be the same two different. People was that new? Was that a new way of approaching adventures, like with these roll tables and like here's a list, choose from this list? Is that what made it so successful? Uh, I can't. I don't know if it was new or not. Uh, other again, the historians who have analyzed this, we'll have to ask John Peterson. Peterson. We'll ask John Peterson. Yeah, nine ways <laughs> from Sunday um, could tell you, but uh, but it, but it's kind of fun. And I had a I got you know uh, Goodman Games re-released this a yeah. year ago. Um, and, and that edition so is, got is gorgeous. Whole, yeah, uh, they did so a, they much did a stuff. Did they, yeah. they did they talk to you about that at all? Oh yeah, they, you know we're gonna we're gonna print it as is, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna uh, have a um, um, up updated version of what you've done, you know, which is for the current version of the game and that right. sort of thing. So yeah, they did. Um, and they had a, it's B one, B two, and B three, right? The whole series yeah, in there, or is yeah, it just? I think it's B one and B two. Just one and B one and B two. Yeah, right. Because that's the whole keep on the borderlands. Keep on the borderlands. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So uh, uh, those of you who are interested, you know, you can check out this adventure. The Goodman Games uh, edition of this is fantastic and, and worthwhile. B one uh, and B two together as, as yeah. a great way yeah. to get into some of the history that you're talking so about. So it has a whole yeah. new audience. Yeah. But a guy comes up to me and he says. I loved your module B1. I, st I still love it. He says, I probably run it a hundred times. And I looked at him like a hundred times. And his buddy's next to him. And his buddy goes, oh, yeah, he's probably run it a hundred times. So, <laughs> and then wow. that guy says, I've run it 30 times. And I just talked to somebody uh, yesterday at the con here. And he said, I'm going to run my niece through this tomorrow. Oh, oh wow. so that's awesome. To, to so think people are running it here? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in fact, tonight's adventure here is kind of based off of that. It's not that setting, but it's... It's kind of a continu continuation, the continuation of that. Of that yeah, right. John, um, Paul Stormberg um, said he. W Paul Stormberg is really behind this Legends of War gaming and reviving a lot of the uh, classics from back in the day. And, yeah, you know, he's just propelled this tremendously, and he's asked me to run Don't Give Up the Ship, and you know, all the, the old timers are coming and running these games that were played avidly in the '70s. I mean, yeah. great, great games, but they nobody up. thinks to play them anymore because yeah. they're from back in the day. Um, well, anyway, he said. Uh, he's done uh, the Gary Khan uh, tournament modules. Tonight, there's going to be 10 teams of nine, mm. as there is every year. And, you know, teams come together and, and compete for this with different DMs. So he said he wants to take some of these TSR modules. I think it was the 
the Giants last year, and then he created the, the tournament module off of the original from the 1970s. Um, so tonight's adventure is based upon and a continuation of the story of Zelgar and Rogan, and Gosh. so the, the adventurers are going to be questing. Oh, for that's so and then you, you, like you've, that. you've expressed yeah. it a few times of like, who knew that this would be something that would uh, yeah, uh, you know yeah. have this much life to it? And you probably just made up Rogan and Zelgar on yeah. a typewriter back in the day, and then yeah. did this, <laughs> yeah. you know, 40 but years. The later. funny thing is when I when I got this manager marketing communications job, I yeah. met a gentleman named Rod Rogan. <gasps> no way. Same oh, yeah. no way. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob so, Zelligar. Yeah, I've, <laughs> not met a, I've not met a Zelligar yet, but <laughs> uh, but I mean, when he said I'm Rod Rogan, I'm shaking the hand. I go, uh, like, are you? So, yeah, did you? Yeah. Were you from Iowa? So, uh, <laughs> uh, well, there's a gentleman named I think, it's, I think his name is Fred Love, and he's he's from Quasquitan. So oh no, he was no always, way. and he's a D and D, uh, you know, role playing guy, and he's so. He said, I, I, you know, I, for years I wanted to ask you, well, I, where did this name come from? And, yeah. and what's the story? I said, well, I lived in Cedar Rapids, so I knew I knew this place. I just thought it was, a, I, I still think it's a very cool name. It's it a very is. Cool name. And it's very unusual. And it's and very stuff. not so Iowa. It's not where it came from. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it now must, have been, must have been a Native, Native American yeah. kind yes. of name. Yes, uh, yeah, I'm sure it probably name. was, yep. Uh, the funny thing was, back in, in the <laughs> 70s, nobody would know that. But now you can go on the Internet and type in Quest right. Creek. Oh, it's a county park in eastern Iowa and that sort of thing. So it's too easy now. But yeah. Um, and then one time, um, I, I was highly entertained and amused by somebody deconstructed the whole B1 module um, mm. from start to finish, and and uh, just like you know, like you would deconstruct Hemingway or a Faulkner novel or that sort of thing. You go in depth. Oh, wow. And, and you know, well, this is the rationale of this and this, and then Mike Carr was thinking this, and this is why he did this. Oh and, my gosh. Which probably three quarters of the time was true, but another quarter of the time is like. I know. I just laughed. At it. No, that's totally lucky right. happenstance. Yeah. Yeah. That, like, but to think that somebody cared that much about it, a lot of people to, did. to go through it in depth, and that's and a guy come up say he's run it a hundred times. I mean, it's tremendously gratifying. It's something that I created back in 1979 has legs. Yeah, that yeah. I mean, that was 40 years ago, and they're still playing it. And then tonight they're going to play a, a kind of a, a jump off from that. It's so amazing. I mean, it's, it's it's amazing. Luke Gygax was uh, when he was here earlier was saying about how Gary Khan is provided, you know, going to provide tens of thousands of more hours for for people to enjoy it's here true. at this weekend. But yeah. now, you know, with this module that you're talking about, like how many? You know, thousands of hours of enjoyment. If that's that one person, if he ran it a yeah, hundred yeah, times, yeah. say it was a four-hour session, like and, that's and crazy amounts of time that there people were, have enjoyed your work. Yeah, yeah, that's and insane. that's and so, you know, it's uh, it's just tremendously gratifying. And and the comp, they're still compliment. Forty years, I wrote that forty years ago, and they're still complimenting me on yeah. it. Boy, that's a boost to your you know to your site. <laughs> yeah. I still I still got it. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so it's, you know, again, I'm glad I raised my hand. I'm glad they gave me the shot at it. And uh, I think it was, and I put a lot of thought into it and tried to just really think how, what interesting things can I, and then there's a room of pools. There's all these different pools and they have different abilities. And you know, one guy says, yeah, I jumped in the pool and I died. <laughs> so oh. I uh, said, well, if you jumped in the other pool, it would have been a lot different. You would have given you a plus one. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, yeah, exactly. so it's just, uh, you know, I just really racked my brain to think of as many things as I could. And, you know, I had the inspiration of uh, Gary Gygax and Dave Arnison. and I participated in, in games that they've run and stuff. So I love um, that. had a sort of thing. So the fact that I was not experienced uh, and deep into it, I think, uh, made it a better, I think so a better too. sort of thing, too. It's really hard when beginners. you are so experienced because there's a lot of things you take for granted and you yeah. just think, oh, like, oh, well, they'll know true. what that is. Yep. But so it is, I always felt like beginner yep. products should be written by yep. somebody and, who and, and isn't so deep in it. I was fortunate to edit, to be the editor for the hardbound books, the Advanced D&D, the Monster Manual, the Player's Handbook, oh, okay. um, and the Dungeon Master's Guide. And there again, my lack of depth allowed me to read what Gary had yeah. written and I think we need to clarify this we need to explain a little more about what this is um, what a what a, a broad knowledge Gary had of, of um, legendary um, worlds and all the fantasy and science fiction and he had a very broad vocabulary mm. for a guy who didn't go to college um, he was a cobbler. I heard he was yeah. a, an avid I mean, uh, reader. He yeah. was he was an avid reader, and you could tell. And, and his writing is high quality. Uh, and I was honored to be the one. You know, Tim Cass said, "Well, there was discussion about should we have Mike Carr edit this or not?" And, and okay, they yeah you know, they trusted me with it. And 
came out really well. And I would go to Gary and I said, can you explain a little bit more about what exactly what you, you mean here so then I can add another sentence of just so that average people. Average person would understand what this right, was because he was so. almost thinking too far ahead, right? Yeah. There's too many details yeah, that was yeah. in his head, and, not and, I, and my vocabulary paper. expanded reading all of his stuff. And I mean, and, I think that's stuff. true now. Everybody's vocabulary who reads these D and D books. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, have to, I mean, I, I was I met up with some old friends uh, uh, two weeks ago. And I just, I don't know, I was just talking as I do normally. And they're like, why are you using such big words? <laughs> like, why is your vocabulary? And this is a, she's a school teacher. Okay. And so uh -huh. she's teaching these people. And she's like, I, I mean, just, and I, and I don't really think about it as I'm talking about it. But it is, I think, due to Dungeons and Dragons and, and reading sure. fantasy novels and all those things. It was, you were forced to, um, you know, kind of interpret words that you may not have ever seen yep, before because yep. they didn't exist in every, any other product except for this yeah, yeah. Uh, thing out there. And, I and think there's certain, your mind there. it's certain terms that are arcane. I mean, it's part of yeah. old English or even arcana. That, yeah, that yeah, word exactly. Itself yeah. yeah, exactly. Would exactly. never have been uh, probably in usage today if it yeah, wasn't for Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. So um, you know, but Gary's uh, vocabulary was very broad, and you know, I I learned a few things along the way, and uh, uh, but the fact that um, I was not deep into it, I think, helped me be a good editor for that yeah. look at it approach. For you know, D and D could be a lot different if you were not there to well, clarify yeah, and I'll edit take that as a compliment. Thank you. Um, yeah. Good editor. But it was it was it was just tremendously gratifying. And then in each of those hardbound books, the Monster Manual, uh, the Player's Handbook, and the Dungeon Master's Guide, one of the perks of being the editor is you get to write the foreword. Mm. So again, and I realized that these were going to have a huge audience, and and they did, uh, that hundreds of thousands of copies were going to be out there. Yeah. Um, and so I really put my thinking cap on before I wrote those forwards. I, what th uh, these products are going to exist for a long time. What, what can I say and what should I say and what do I want to say in yeah. the foreword where I can address the readers of this book? And and the foreword's going to be the first thing they read when they open it up. Mm -hmm. So those forewords, I put a lot of, a lot of work into you know, the messaging, I guess, and what yeah. I wanted to say, and you've got one page to say it. And, and, and uh, you know, people are still bringing me those books. Oh, Mike, would you sign, would you sign With my the book? And so, oh, yeah, yeah, cool. so, um, hey, let me ask you a random yeah. question since you were the editor of these books. Uh, I think it's the Dungeon Master's Guide, but I could okay. be wrong. There is a two-page script of what a common... Oh, like a back and forth, a okay. dialogue? Yeah. Okay. Uh, w w do you remember that? Was that uh, something that, that was in there when you got the manuscript or was something that I you added? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't answer definitively. Because that's I something I always look back on as their attempt uh, at TSR to... To, show, to show a glimpse, a glimpse of yeah. what it was like, because yeah. reading the 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 the, the rules in the, yeah. in a manual is very hard to kind of show. And now yeah. we are in this age where streaming yeah. and sure. and uh, live play uh, is is so prevalent that most of think people learn how to play by watching sure. Sure. rather than by by reading the books. They obviously use yeah. the books, yeah. you know, once they start you know to take that leap on their own. Um, but I always go back to that script because it was like that was they were trying. I don't think it was necessarily successful. Uh, uh -huh. At getting people to what a common uh, a D and D sure. game was like, but maybe it was, you know, in in, in the in the conception of that that script. But it gave them a clue. It gave them a clue. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, what do you think now about the fact that people can watch so many games online, and that has become uh, kind of the number one way to get people to, to know about this? I I, I think hobby. it's good. You know, um, uh, it's better if you're playing, but at yeah. least again, you can enjoy that and see sort of thing. Uh, one of the cool things currently is uh, the media has kind of rediscovered, I mean, there's, and I was talking to Peter Adkison, he's the owner of Gen Con, uh, just last night, and we talked about uh, the, there seems to be a second wave of popularity for this sort of thing, and you've got, you know, Sheldon Cooper on Big Bang Theory talking <laughs> about going to Gary Con, yeah. uh, and stuff like that, so uh, there's been a lot more uh, media attention, and Sofia Vergara is on Entertainment Tonight talking about this. Is right. We have this is our Dungeons and Dragons room in our house in Hollywood and stuff like that. I mean, that's that's very cool. Um, so it's it's gone mainstream, but uh, as Peter calls it, the hockey stick effect. I mean, it's a, it's having a second wave of uh, of that sort of thing. And and, and we were uh, we were complimenting on you know you're the guy who saved Gen Con and that sort of thing. And he said, yeah, well I'm happy to do. It. I've always loved Gen Con, etc. And he said, but. It's exceed, you know, it's exceeded my <laughs> expectations. That it's even more popular now than I ever thought it would be or could be, and, mm. and, and because of this second wave of popularity, so you know, geek culture has become you know mainstream in a, in a way, um, and and in a good way. And people are you know, yeah. You know, 
I don't and, think it's uh, even geek culture anymore. No, you know, no, because it's, it's become it's mainstream. You know, yeah. as I, I've, I've talked to parents who sure. I wouldn't call geeks, but they're wanting to get their kids into it because of all the benefits that oh, they yeah. see Tremendous from benefits, the game. Yeah. They're not yeah. looking. Yeah. You know, obviously people it's much different than like when to you besmirch were screens. Up. I know, right? And, exactly. and and look at Comic Con. That's how. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's just that's incredible. That's a pop culture. You know, and, and, uh, com- interest in comics in the '60s and '70s. That was kind of a niche, niche sort of thing, and it was not in the in the mainstream. But now. And then, you know, same with cosplay and all of this, you know, I mean, it's just uh, acceptable. It's just yeah. one more inter- way to entertain yourself and learn. But these, these hobbies are tremendously uh, beneficial because of the interactive nature, I think. Yeah. And, and, you know, and if you're going to uh, be in creating a dungeon, you start to, you know, do a little research sometimes and you look up one thing or another if you're tying in with medieval or that sort of thing. And, of course, historical uh, basis, that's always really interesting. And, you know, with san- fantasy and science fiction, the sky's the limit. I mean, it's yep. just totally wide open, yeah. True. So. It's true. I'm excited uh, about where the future is, but I'm also really uh, grateful to be able to talk to you about the history, about where it came from, and everything like that. So thank you so much for, well, for coming welcome. on and, and, and sharing all those stories. Yeah. I mean, that's it's really amazing. I, I would encourage you know the, the listeners here if you've never been to Gary Kahn, you know, put it on your list. And yeah. same with Gen Con. I mean, Gen Con is huge now. Some people, some people say, oh, it's too big. I decided I don't enjoy it like it back in the day, but. Uh, it's it's an extravaganza. You got to go at least once. It's yeah, just amazing. It. And, but and here I love the, the history of that. You're able to kind of uh, yeah. You can play yeah. Yeah. games with the people who design yes, the games. That, like that's, that's, that, like you said, that doesn't that's happen. That's the number one thing at Gary Khan. You can you can play and talk to and interact with. The old timers, the people that were there at the creation, and when they were sixteen years old, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, and and um, like I said, uh, you know, I don't know why the whole D and D world isn't coming to play Bronstein with with Dave Wesley, the guy. I know, and That's that was be on the my whole genesis. Now. That was yeah. the whole genesis of, of role playing. That was, and I mean, it's like playing basketball with James Naismith or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, who wouldn't? Who loves basketball? Wouldn't want to yeah, play. Yeah, get, get a piece of that. Exactly, history. and so uh, that may not be a direct uh, parallel, but you That's know, my good. point is the same. And and, he, and he's not the only one. I mean, there's other people, the the, the, the people who are in Legends of War gaming. Thanks to Paul Stormberg, who's kind of very uh, single. I don't want to say single-handed, but uh, he and Kevin, his his friend, they make all this happen. There's a whole list of two dozen or more Legends of War gaming event, probably well more than that. Um, there are all these old games that nobody plays anymore, but they're tremendously fun, and, and, and so it's a, it's a bit of discovery for people participating in that sort of thing. So I would urge people to come and try some of these old games and, and do it while the old timers are still around. So cool. Speaking of history, yeah. do you have anything from uh, your TSR days, like any memorabilia that you've kept that people would really y- keep Yes. Uh, the problem was... Uh, Every time a new product would come out, they would come and pass them out to the employees. Yeah. And if I wasn't interested in it, I would turn them down. Well, now these <laughs> items are going for, yeah. you know, uh, ridiculous. The collectors, sums. Yeah. The collectors who are listening <laughs> to this are being like, what did no, you do? Yeah, what? Yeah. No. So, uh, I mean, somebody's somebody's business card went for $70 in an auction. Oh, now. yeah. I mean, <laughs> I imagine like all the... Like now, I, I think I have all of my, I think I have all my payroll stubs, you know, so if oh, I if I get ten bar, ten dollars a piece for those, yeah. Um, so I yeah I have. Does, did it have the logo on it with the weird TSR wizard? I don't wizard? think it did. No. Because I'll, I'll be happy to autograph any of them. And it'll say Mike Mike Carr. Yeah, right. Um, Can't cash I'm, these anymore. No, no, and it's just the stub. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but I mean, but there's uh, people are paying goofy amounts for these oh, things. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Because they're the real thing. So so yes, I have some artifacts. Um, at some point. Um, I need to go in the attic and, and pull them out. I have some uh, modules that are still in the original wrapping. I mean, even like just old. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, we know oh, a few people a who one. might enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. And the shrink wrap, I know. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, it's very, very valuable. So, yeah, I do. And, and uh, um, the amounts, you know, Paul Sturmberg is one of the premier auction guys handling this. Yeah. This, and, he, you know, he's a, that's his... That's his job. He's in, you know, his career. He's, he's doing that. Plus, he's interested in the history, of, and he does historian well, and, and stuff. So. And if other people are interested, we mentioned Art and Arcana. It's a great way yeah. to oh, trace that, the visual history. Oh, it's tremendous. Those early that days. book it goes is, up to today. Book uh, is wonderful. Uh, yeah. The B one module that uh, Goodman yeah. Games uh, released is is uh, another great art. Bless their hearts. Yeah, they yeah. love <laughs> it. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. It's it does a little bit of that work of trying to show what it was like, you know, first, sure, and then sure. you know, uh, uh, updating it for fifth edition D D, which yeah. you know is great for for people who are playing. Now. Now, um, but if there's, uh, what are other ways people can like follow your work and what you've done so far? Well, um, the the uh, World War One aviation, the what was fight in the skies game that Gary Gygax, you know, 
urged me to self-publish, and I did. And then yeah. he helped arrange Guidon Games, which was Don Lowry in this um, early '70s, to publish in a in a you know boxed version. And then when I came to TSR, that was one of the early TSR box games, like right after Dungeon and um, uh, Empire of the Petal Throne. Um, that game has is that uh, in print? Do you think people find it now? Well, it's uh, later. Several editions became Dawn Patrol. TSR did it as Dawn Patrol last, oh, publi okay. last published in 83, 84. You might be able to find um, copies of that. Yeah, oh, yeah. there's lots of copies. They, they printed more than 50,000 copies. Um, but That's the good. game is still played, and we have an active group in, in the Midwest particularly. But the Fight in the Sky Society, which goes back to June of 1969, still exists. We just published n issue number 180 oh, of wow. our newsletter. And now, wow. back in those days, it was mimeographed or, or uh, uh, ditto, mimeographed. if anybody remembers the purple. I remember ditto. I remember yeah. the smell. Yeah, um, but now <laughs> so the good. smell. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. You could get, you could, in theory, you could maybe get high on that. But yeah. <laughs> um, but now with desktop publishing, it's an honest and goodness it's magazine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and we have a number of motivated individuals who love the Dawn Patrol game, uh, and they the society operates on on volunteer. We you know volunteer treasurer. Um, I edit some of the issues, but uh, next issue is going to be a volunteer editor. Uh, and we've got uh, in several weeks in Milwaukee in April, we've got the Dawn Patrol Mini Con. We have it every year. Mm. Wow. Um, and um, other events, and we have a full slate at Gen Con. I would invite anybody to play uh, at Gen Con. It, and then is there any. Uh, it's the only game that's been played every year at Gen Con since number one. That's so amazing. Whoa. That's a cool thing. Right? Uh, and hopefully, long that was the one you played. You played well, Fighting the Skies. Yeah, and hopefully, oh, yeah. Gen Con. Ho my hope is long after I'm gone, they'll still be playing it at Gen Con. So, Absolutely. You know, you if you're out there up. listening and you like this game, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, keep it going. Oh, that's um, great. So, yeah, is there any like kind of uh, a website or a URL where yeah, people can uh, go Dawn, to check this out? Yeah, dawnpatrol.info. Okay. And um, so the game hasn't been published in a box version since the 1980s and uh, I'm working on a new edition which I've been for a long time I've been remiss in getting a new edition out so yeah. that's that's hopefully in the future put that in the newsletter yep <laughs> and uh, but one of our one of our avid players who was from Whitewater Wisconsin not far from Lake Geneva played in junior high and high school uh, his name is Rick Johnson and his career now is uh, as a top shelf video programmer uh, for video games mm -hmm. and virtual reality and that stuff so he um, out of the generosity of his heart and his love of the game created an online version for us. Oh, which cool. is not only functional, it is superb. Mm. Wow. And so that has propelled a little bit of additional interest. And so every, every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Central and every Monday night at 7 p.m. Central, the Fight in the Sky Society can get together online. Sometimes there's four people, six, eight, whatever. Yeah. And that's the beauty of the game. You can play with any number from four on up. Yeah. Uh, gets together and plays. And this, this online system is just phenomenal excellent and oh, computer cool. does everything That'd be a great way to check it out yeah, yeah. and and um, you know and do you have any like so social media uh, type things you know if people want to follow you um, not me personally but there I think the, the fight in the sky society has a Facebook page and that kind of thing. excellent cool um, all right well I have enough distractions without being on social media that's yeah, good. I, uh, that, yeah, that's You're probably happier for <laughs> Some people tell me that, that they envy that. Yeah. It is true. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I'm, I always toy with deleting it whenever I you know, get yeah, overwhelmed yeah. with stuff, so, for sure. Um, so uh, dawnpatrol.info is the site, and, and people can find this game um, you know, through Excellent. online sources. And, and you're, like you said, you're going to be at the next Gen Con uh, and then yeah. Gary yeah, Con's to come. So yeah. uh, definitely if you're going to be in either of those conventions going forward, uh, come check out Find Mike Bendizier about all the amazing yeah, stuff. Yeah, and uh, we have several people. George Henyon is our event coordinator. He puts the slate of games on at Gary Con and at Gen Con and other stuff. And he's a wonderful gentleman who loves the game and, and uh, is yeah. uh, so happy you can to sign up for is this and stuff. So, uh, the good news is all I have to do is show up. Uh, and, and, you know, I used to do that back in the day when I was at TSR. I'd run the games at Gen Con and that sort of thing. So it's, it's just it's gratifying. The people love this game enough that, you know, they're continuing to propel it forward. And I love hopefully that. Hopefully there'll be a new edition in the future. And they're all bugging me about that. And, and I got to, you know, make that happen. So, yeah. um, but it's still got legs and they're still playing it. And we have 75 people who pay $15 a year to be part of this society. And it's, it's you know, it's a <laughs> break even That's proposition. Amazing. Um, That's great. And, and we keep it as low as possible. Yeah, we talked right. to two guys yesterday, and they're in the Midwest. And I said, man, you're right in the thick of You're right here. We you got should have it. Yeah, yeah, we got events coming up. So. Well, yeah. thank you so much uh, for all of your contributions to Dungeons & Dragons yeah. in general, uh, you know, being a part of it, being uh, the first cleric, uh, for being at yeah. every Gen Con, for uh, uh, writing the B1 uh, module, but also taking on the manufacturing. Never an easy task yeah. to be able to do. Yeah. So uh, uh, 
from from all, all the D and D fans who are, are reaping the benefits of that hard work. Thank you for, yeah. for all well, you've done. Thank you, and I appreciate everyone's interest. And you know, it's very gratifying for me. And, and people come up and say, "Oh, can I have my picture taken with you?" And it's kind of a treat, so. <laughs> You know, being a minor celebrity is, is a good thing. It's, it's, uh, it's yeah. enough of a treat and not a burden at all. So it's pretty it's pretty awesome. It's fun, yeah. and, and people are so appreciative, and, and they have so much fun. I, people say, oh, thank you for creating this Dom Trill game. I have so much fun with this game. Oh, we played this in high school all the time. Yeah, right. And, and I've so, run it 400 times. Right. Yeah, we yeah. had one guy said, I just, I just put Dom Patrol on the Internet, you know, in a search engine that came up. I said, I had no idea people were still playing this game I played 30 years ago. And, oh, you know, yeah. I want to join your group. And then, so, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. That's but awesome. It's all about the fun, I mean, yeah. really, at the end of the day, so. Good. Again, thank you. It's, it's been great. It's been fun, um, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. We are wrapping up here for this Coffee Talk edition of Dragon Talk. Thank you to everyone who is able to uh, watch live. Uh, this has been really lots of fun. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, uh, I believe our first interview Nine. is with Zeb Cook. Yeah. Uh, and then we're also talking to Darlene, the artist, as well as Penny Williams uh, tomorrow. And then on Sunday, speaking to Margaret Weiss and Stefan Picorni, uh, which is going to be tons of fun. Uh, so check back then and then of course uh, there are going to be live streamed games here from this very location on the GaryCon uh, Twitch channel which we'll be hosting on D&D &D, uh, as well so look for uh, some fun stuff there including Shelly Mazzanobel playing yay that's Flapper Flapper it's coming <laughs> back it's going to be fun and he better survive excellent well thank you again thank you to Mike and Luke for being our guests uh, uh, on this first Coffee Talk Dragon Talk our first remote Yes, exactly. This is the first time we've done it remotely. That's yeah. true. Yeah, so you got to see it all happen. Oh, we should have had you first. And then you could have been the first the, Dragon yeah, really Talk the remote first interview. interview. Yeah. Number two is still okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm honored. So really, thank you. No worries. No, thank uh, you. We really enjoyed it. And thank you to everyone watching. And we'll be back uh, uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Central Time. So we'll coffee, see you guys coffee. then. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.